Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of NHLN Opinion Plus, a weekly series airing every Friday. This is a space for our opinions where we talk about current events and questions the Latino community is curious about. Today, we are joined by Executive Director of Seacoast Outright, Hershey Hirschkopf. Hershey was appointed to her current position in 2019. She has over 35 years of experience within the nonprofit sector serving local communities. Welcome, Hershey. Thank you for joining us this week. Thanks for having me, Helena. I appreciate it. Of course, I was hoping we could start off, um, for those who might not know about Seacoast Outright, if you could tell us a little bit about the organization's work within the Seacoast community and beyond, along with some of its history. Sure. Uh, so we were founded in 1993. It was the outcome of a conference at, at um, UNH that was called Respect for All Youth. It was spearheaded by an, a partner organization, PFLAG, which stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbian and Gays. It was That was founded in the 70s. And just like it sounds, it, it consists of um, parents and friends who were worried at the time that there weren't any services for LGBTQ youth um, in this area in particular. And within a few months um, after the conference, they had formed our organization. And um, ever since then, we have stayed true to our mission of serving, advocating for, and supporting LGBTQ youth in not just the seacoast area in southern Maine and northern New Hampshire and Seacoast, New Hampshire itself, but um, sorry, Northern Massachusetts, but throughout New Hampshire, actually. At this point, I'd say we broadly serve most of the state. Um, there aren't a lot of other organizations doing our work. Um, mm -hmm. There are organizations certainly who serve youth and have um, some niche around what we do, but really we're the only one besides rural outright on the other side of the state and um, who has been uh, working in this, in this sort of demographic. So. Mm -hmm. That's our history. We've always had about one or one and a half staff people. Uh, we're volunteer based. We offer a variety of programming to support youth. Uh, and, you know, I sort of think of it as being on two sides of our house. Um, one is sort of things that are direct services to kids. And the other is uh, sort of outreach and education and how we work in a larger community. Thank you for that. That was a great explanation. Um, before we continue discussing the organization's work and services, I'd like to clarify who exactly is eligible or encouraged to access its resources. Sure. Um, you know, technically, the age range we see is 11 to 22. Um, I, I like to think of it as aligned more as basically middle schoolers and high schoolers and some young adults. Um, I would love to um, <clears throat> expand into dealing with uh, sort of a broader young adult range. We're not quite there yet. So, and I also like to um, start dealing with kids who are younger than middle school. We certainly have parents of transgender youth clamoring to see services or a group for kids who are coming out earlier and earlier as transgender and need help. So, you know, at some point we'll sort of re-envision what that is. But for now, you know, we, ha we have a very clear mission of who we serve. Um, the median age, you know, most of the kids we see are somewhere around 14, 15, and 16. And they are the ones who uh, need our support the most. But, you know, there are always outliers, younger and older kids as well. And in fact, you know, we get uh, calls from adults looking for services and even older adults looking for services. And there has been certainly a movement in the LGBTQ community, not that we're monolithic, but, you know, across the, across the U.S. generally, um, of groups starting to look at senior needs. And that's been going on for about 10 years and that there's, you know, aging baby boomers, uh, I think believe Maine is the sort of agingest um, state in the union, uh, followed, you know, not far behind be with New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, and those services are also going to become very important as time goes on. And we're seeing groups starting to look at those as well. Hmm. That's very interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about more about the public services the organization offers, especially your support groups? Sure. I would love to. Um, so, We've always had um, a Friday night group that meets every week. Uh, it, it, it meets initially all together. And I'm gonna talk about as if COVID has not hit quite yet. So when we're in person, uh, we've had a few different venues uh, right before we shut down, we were meeting at South Church um, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And uh, we'd have about 25 or so kids. Uh, we would meet together and then break into group by age. So usually around 16 or so, the older group would go in one room, the younger group in another. Each group would have two adult facilitators who are volunteers that we recruit and train and try to support. Uh, and we meet for a couple of hours. 
And there's some structure in the meeting, but generally speaking, you know, it's a time for talking about, you know, good parts of your week, bad parts, highs and lows, we call them, and then general discussion guided by adults. Um, aside from Friday night, now under COVID, we've also expanded into a game night every Tuesday. So at seven o'clock, we have some people who get together and we play Pictionary online or Among Us on your phone while having Zoom open so people can talk. Uh, we also have started a Discord chat space recently. So that meets on Monday and Wednesday evenings. And that is moderated by also um, a couple of great volunteers from UNH, UNH students. Uh, and we're hoping it's going to be peer led eventually. So, and by moderate, I mean, really uh, it's not guided by the adults. They might get it going, but um, they try to step back and let that be a space where kids can just do their own thing. And it's, it's text-based. So we do see lots of kids who have anxiety and depression and being on screen is difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I'm segueing into what's going on with COVID, I guess. So, um, so this text-based chat is a lot easier for them and much more popular with some groups of kids. So we definitely wanted to provide that. Uh, and then we also recently um, were funded by DHHS in New Hampshire and have been trying to start an LGBT youth group for kids in recovery from substance misuse. Uh, and we're recruiting for that. And it, it's been it's been a bit difficult, but we're 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 still working on that. We're making our way through the gay straight alliances now called gender and sexuality alliances in middle schools and high schools, especially in Rockingham and Stratford counties that we serve the most um, to get kids who need those services and support. And I think the idea is the model is that um, especially for kids in intensive outpatient recovery groups, um, this is another added layer of support we can add. Um, a lot of kids in substance misuse recovery laps out when they go back to their original group of friends. And this is a way for them to have a new group of friends and new activities and just fun stuff to do. And that is also run by um, some UNH interns that we have and uh, we're, we're hoping to recruit. So if you need our services, definitely find us. Um, I want to plug a couple of more options that we offer um, for, for kids who need more support. Um, we also offer a, uh, the PRISM program is a partnership with Big Brothers Big Sisters New Hampshire that we started about a year ago, uh, and we're slowly ramping up now that COVID is, uh, you know, not fading away exactly, but becoming more manageable. And PRISM stands for Pride, Respect, Identity, Safety, and Mentoring. And this is a program where we identify kids that need that support, and we also identify volunteers who might want to work sort of more, not clinically, but more one-to-one. -one. And it's, it's a great idea. They have, you know, the infrastructure, the staff, and um, a way of supporting these kids. And we send them the people who need us. And they do a match. And that way, our LGBTQ kids have, like, an adult in their life in their corner, especially for kids who don't have maybe supportive a supportive household, right, at home. And that's really – or maybe aren't even out so much. Um, this is a way for them to have a, a like-minded and sympathetic or empathetic adult in their, in their corner. Um, we also have a, a monthly parent support group that has been meeting uh, for years that a couple of our, of our board members run together um, and is also facilitated. And it has a hybrid model, so it meets in person um, and also on Zoom for people who can't get there or also aren't happy about it. So um, I'll just I'll go on a bit more if you don't mind about more of our programming. Um, go for it. I, you know, I've realized we don't we don't sort of in some ways have direct services to adults, but we also offer adults the opportunity to volunteer. And in that sense, we have a, a, an adult community of LGBTQ people, but also of allies, like it's an opportunity and we don't card kids or, or adults um, about who they are. They can be allies and join our groups if they want. That's fine with us. Um, we're very open that way. Um, but a lot of adults come to us and are either looking for services and we suggest they volunteer or want to volunteer. And of course we spend time trying to look at, you know, who they are, their skill set. Sometimes we actually advertise for very particular um, volunteers that we need. I have a, I call it my Seacoast Outright History Project and I have two great volunteers. One is a 14 year old lesbian in Manchester and a young 22 year old man in Rye who were both been working on this for a few months as a group and we meet as a team. We have a queering space group right now that has actually a straight white guy 
um, and two lesbians um, who are putting together a better sort of cult cultural proficiency training that we offer. Um, and we do that on request. Uh, we have a suicide prevention training that we've recently revamped through Connor's Climb with a UNH intern um, who is a gay man in their MSW program. So we have, you know, a lot going on. COVID has sort of given us some space to revise and revamp programming that hasn't been looked at in a while and that I thought really could use a once over. And in that sense, we create a space for adult volunteers. Um, we have many who volunteer as facilitators for these groups and help run them. I actually only show up once in a while at this point. And we have, um, well, before COVID, of course, we would have, you know, quarterly get togethers and thank you dinners. And I hope we actually add more of that to what we do when we open fully again. And then we also do um, sort of one-off events or annual events for our kids. We have, you know, a Halloween party, a costume party, and a holiday party. We have an open mic night that was very popular in March. We do a family cookout in the summer. And we put on, we are the people who produce Pride in Portsmouth. So a lot of people, I think, don't realize that we put on Pride. But not only is it a great community event and 5,000 people stream in for a march and a rally, and we have 100 vendors or so at Strawberry Bank Museum, who are fabulous partners, I might add. Um, you know, and we have speeches and entertainment. Uh, we also, you know, it's also a big fundraiser for us. And so, you know, that's been a real challenge this year. Like many groups, of course, a lot of our fundraisers are really different and look different. And, you know, thank goodness for all sorts of New Hampshire um, nonprofit funding and CARES Act funding that is, has trickled down to a lot of nonprofits um, to help us get through this, this challenging time. Right, absolutely. So, I'll stop I there, mean, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, thank you for going into that. Um, we're really excited to share all these resources. Um, but I like that last note that you made, um, you know, helping you is helping so many other communities. And as we see, not just youths, but different age groups, and that's really great work. Um, I was, so the organization, I'm switching gears a little bit since we're running out of time, but um, you published a statement on the website that you and the board of the directors signed. One line reads, we must be diligent in dealing with racism within our own community, and at the same time, fight alongside the nationwide anti-racism movement led by Black Lives Matter. In what ways do you think the organization embraces or can advocate for inclusion and diversity within the LGBTQ community? Well, I'll repeat this again. I mean, you know, and no organization and no movement of people is, you know, monolithic. Right. Uh, but, you know, racism has always existed in the LGBTQ movement. Certainly the liberation side of it has been a lot more embracing of um, people of color uh, and making sure that all of our needs intersect. And on the other hand, you know, there's homophobia within the BIPOC community as well. And, and then there's an intersection, right? And talking about that intersectionality is a great place, I think, to have the conversation of how do we serve people of color within our community and how do we also um, challenge the racism within it? So, you know, obviously it's not enough to put out a statement on your website. And in fact, I'm late putting out one about um, Asian, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but it's about to get up there. Uh, and racism, of course, we know is different in different communities. Certainly racism around the black community is different than it is from the Asian community is different from it is in the Latino community. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it sort of starts at home, I think. And so, you know, our board is going through its own look at, you know, within ourselves, I think about how we, how we view racism and how we, how it plays out. Um, and we have reached out to be allies, I think, to other groups. Um, so, you know, we're working on connecting with um, Seacoast BLM and um, what we can do to partner with them. And I think working in that sort of ally space is really important. Uh, we certainly have made more of an effort. Um, we had a virtual pride in um, last October. We sort of delayed, we did something in June, but we delayed till October. And we ensured that out of our five events, three of them actually were, two of them were really focused on that intersection. One was a, a, a discussion panel, a Zoom panel, moderated by a woman of color who's now on our board, um, Yasmin Safarzeda, who was working at the YWCA um, of New Hampshire at the time. 
Uh, and it included, you know, it was a queer BIPOC panel to have a discussion about that. And another one of our um, events was a movie about Bayard Rustin, who was uh, a gay man of a, a gay black man or a black gay man. Hmm, I'm not sure how he would define himself. I guess a gay black man, maybe. Um, it was a documentary film called Brother Outsider. And we reached out to Dream, which is a group at uh, Dover High School, also working in, um, you know, uh, an anti-racism space there. So, you know, we're trying to find intersections with other groups where we can work together and look at the racism that we, you know, need to challenge. Right, so, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, part of that is looking at, you know, um, how we present ourselves, how we make it a good space, how we intersect with other organizations, how we deal with it on a personal level, on a one-to-one -one level, but how we deal with it um, as a face of an organization. And, you know, it's a, it's a complex issue. Um, mm -hmm. And it's certainly a dicey one that people work very hard to choose words carefully and make sure you say the right thing um, and your heart is in the right place. And I think we all we all need to work on that across the board. And I hate to sound sort of glib and cliche, but, you know, I really believe none of us are free till all of us are free. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of the place I come from and where I try to lead the organization. Um, you know, we also live in a very, very white area. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there, I think. Right. Thanks to recognize. Yeah. I look forward to following the organization's work. Um, thank you so much for your time, expertise, and candidacy. We really appreciate it. Um, so thank you for talking with us, Executive Director Hirschkopf, and for being our guest on NHA, NHLN Opinion Plus this week. Thanks for having me. And thanks for the great work you do. It's so important. Oh, thank you. Of course. Everyone, please tune in next week. We'll have another episode, of course. Follow us on Twitter at NH Latino News and Instagram at NH underscore Latino News. I'm Belen Dumont with NHLN Opinion Plus, and I will see you all next time.